Hello, this is Dr. Hudson, and today we have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Maurice Elias. And Dr. Elias is a professor of psychology at Rutgers, and he is also the director of Social, Emotional, and Character Development uh, Lab at Rutgers University. So welcome, Dr. Elias. We're so happy to have you. Thank you. My pleasure. So today we're going to talk about your article entitled, An On-Site Advocate for Every Student. Um, when you open up this article, you talk about something called SEED. Um, what exactly is SEED? What does that stand for? Well, SEED, of course, is uh, one of many acronyms on the planet. Uh, <laughs> it's S-E-A-D, and it stands for Social, Emotional, and Academic Development. And basically, it's a term that is being used now to help us all recognize that when we think about kids' development, we have to think about their social, emotional, and their intellectual and academic development as one thing and not as somehow two separate things. Mm -hmm. So the term SEED, S-E-A-D, Social, Emotional, and Academic Development, is designed to try to get us to start to to, you know, take things that we sometimes put into separate boxes and mix them together. Awesome. Okay. So when we're talking about SEED, the social, emotional, and academic development, um, you talk about uh, a person being a SEED liaison. Um, if you could talk a little more about what a SEED liaison is and, and what that looks like. Sure. So, so let me start off by saying um, that Kids' ability to do well in school depends on a lot of different things. Yes. And one of the most important of those is their, their state of mind and their state of heart. And we don't always think about that. Sometimes mm -hmm. we think that kids uh, come into school, they can put their books in the locker, they can put their coats in the locker or hang them up and put them in their cubbies and put their feelings in there too. Mm -hmm. but, but they can't do that. Their feelings stay with them all day long. Right. And so social emotional development really is to, to clue us in to the fact that we have to think about how kids deal with their emotions, their ability to recognize how other people are feeling, whether or not they've got the skills to control their strong feelings. You know, if you're a kid and you're sitting in class and you're very upset about things that have happened at home, things that have just happened on, on the bus, on your way to school, there's a really good chance that you're not going to be listening to what the teacher is saying. Or Absolutely. if you're going to listen, you're not going to listen too carefully. Mm -hmm. It turns out that, you know, all kids have issues. But if you don't have the ability to sort of get past those issues, put some of those feelings uh, under control a little bit, if you don't have the ability to do that, then it turns out that it's going to impair your ability in school. Yes. So, you know, what happens is that we've got a lot of people who are watching out for kids' academic development. Kids get tested all the time. We've got all kinds of academic screenings. So we've got a lot of that stuff. But we have very little focusing on the kids' social and emotional well-being. Mm -hmm. And so a seed liaison is somebody in the school whose job it is to focus on the child's social and emotional well-being, on a specific set of social and emotional skills, uh, you know, appropriate to uh, every age, and how a child is doing with those skills. Mm -hmm. That sounds spot on, you know. Um, like you said, we do a lot of testing, we do a lot of measuring that academic bar and where each student stands um, in relation to that. But 
um, our jobs as educators um, in whatever capacity we serve in education is to help provide a holistic education. So we definitely need to take care of that social emotional um, aspect of our children. Yeah, you know, if you think about it in a very practical way, um, for every kid that walks into a school, we, we want them to do well and, and we want them to feel welcomed and we want them to feel supported. You know, here, here in the U.S., we're uh, embarking on the start of a new school year and, and we want our kids to get off on the right foot. And so it's important that we see it that they do get off on the right foot. Mm -hmm. But nobody is really responsible for that. So the way I look at it, you know, you could take a simplified view of this. And imagine, you know, you have a school and you've got a roster of kids. And next to the name of uh, every kid is going to be a staff person who is going to look after their social and emotional development. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you think about your school social workers, counselors, psychologists, health educators, school nurses, if they divided up the school, mm -hmm. um, you would probably that would probably work. Mm -hmm. And each of those folks would have a responsibility of looking after a kid's social, emotional, academic development. And you know, this is going to require some conversation in the school. Mm -hmm. Oh, we'd have to say, okay, which particular skills are we going to keep track of? And uh, you know, let's get some developmental descriptions of the skills at different age levels because obviously, you know, for example, you, you certainly don't expect a kindergarten kid to be able to calm themselves down all by themselves and they're upset, Right. but you can expect that in a high school kid mm -hmm. or a, a seventh or eighth grader. So, you know, we have to understand that there's a development to these skills mm -hmm. and so we want to hold the kids, quote unquote, uh, accountable for what it's possible for them to do. Mm -hmm. And so basically, if all these individuals were able to keep track of this, then at report card time, we would be able to um, let parents know not only how kids are doing academically, but how kids are doing socially and emotionally. Right. So I don't think it would have to really add a tremendous amount what's going on in the school. Quite frankly, uh, I think that if we actually did a cost benefits analysis, we would find that if we added one or two folks to a school that had this job, the improvements in attendance, the reductions in discipline incidents, the reductions in health, negative health outcomes would more than offset the cost of those personnel. But, you know, sometimes we don't think preventively. Sometimes we, we are, we're more likely to hire someone to deal with something after the fact mm. than preventively. Right. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about all of the things that you're saying, and one thing that comes to mind is that when we have a reduction in the aforementioned things, um, absences, the amount of discipline referrals, that's going to automatically increase the academic performance bottom line because students don't have that worry or um, they're not lacking those skills because they are being supported in those areas. Well, that, that's exactly right. You know, I'll, I'll tell you a, a, a little story um, of a little project that we did in uh, uh, Gunnell in New Jersey. Uh, one of my graduate students did a very interesting uh, randomized controlled trial a very, with a very good experimental design. And uh, what he basically looked at was how we help kids get ready for math tests. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it, do you remember when you were younger what your teachers uh, told you about how to prepare for a test that you were going to have? Do you remember? I do, actually, I, many moons ago, but I remember it was always, you know, get a good night's rest and have a great breakfast in the morning. <laughs> right, exactly. Yes. Good night, and of course, study. Yes. So, yes. So, so half the kids at random were told exactly that before every math quiz or math test, 
get a good night's sleep, have a good breakfast, and study. Mm -hmm. The other half of the kids were taught a breathing technique, and they were just basically told before they sat down for the test, just calm yourself down, take a few breaths before you start the test. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, across quizzes and exams across the whole year, the kids who were taught the breathing technique did better. Yes. Now, yeah. it's not like the breathing, they were breathing in like math knowledge. They were <laughs> right. just breathing in air, right. you know? So it didn't make them smarter. What it made them do was to perform more to the level of their ability mm -hmm. because they were able to control their anxiety about the test. Absolutely. And so, so, that, so that's, that's really, you know, when you're saying that, that these things uh, will help with the academic bottom line, that's how they work. It's not some sort of mysterious thing. Mm -hmm. It's that if you're, you're more under control in academic test situations, you're going to do better. Mm -hmm. If you're a better problem solver than when you're doing a project by yourself or with your peers and you run into an obstacle, you're going to be more likely to be able to get past it. Right. If you're a good goal setter and planner, and you can anticipate consequences. You're going to be better in terms of how you study, and you're going to use your time better. You're going to think a little bit more when your friends say, oh, you know, let's go out on a given night, and, you know, you know that you've got to test and you've got to prepare. You're going to be able to sort all this out better. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not mysterious as to how it works. Right. It's pretty clear. And, and we also know that definitely, Definitely, in all walks of life, the kids who don't have these skills turn out to be at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And in thinking about this, this whole concept of an advocate for every student in the school, um, I... I am a school counselor by profession, and I'm thinking about how much is already on our plates as school counselors. Um, and when you're talking about who exactly could be a um, a seed liaison within the school, and I I can even envision the school counselors, um, maybe with the help of the school psychologist, being leaders in this seed project, in that teaching teachers, other faculty members, um, these different skills, these different tools. And so you've actually widened your pot of who can be a liaison. It could be an actual school-wide effort. And leading the way could be the school counselors in providing the, the professional development, the training needed, um, providing even activities um, for you know, the, the given faculty who are going to be seed liaisons um, to do with students, even the school doing school-wide, you know, a certain time during the day um, or each week that they do activities with students and connect with um, the student that they are being a liaison for. Well, I don't think there's any doubt that that is a viable model. But, but I'll tell you, when I, when I was proposing this, uh, I was envisioning that at some point, it would become a, an actual professional role that would exist in the school, mm -hmm. that there would be somebody whose job description said that they were a seed liaison. And professionally, that person could be a counselor. It could be a social worker, psychologist, health educator, et cetera. So, you know, there, there are different professionals whose training would allow them to take over that job. Mm -hmm. but, but I think eventually that would have to be a, somebody's primary responsibility. Uh, and, and I think that's true because the, the one element of this that we haven't really talked about um, is the issue of communicating with uh, parents. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, the, one of the most important things that a seed liaison would do. Uh, because the parents really want to know about kids' social and emotional development. Mm -hmm. when, when, I, when I have uh, worked with parents, parent groups, 
uh, I've sometimes asked them uh, a, a series of questions. I've asked parents, raise your hand if you want your schools to make kids knowledgeable. And of course, they all raise their hands. And then I say, well, okay, what, is, what about responsible? Do you want schools to help your kids be responsible? They raise their hand. How about drug-free? Of course, their hands go up. Right. How about caring? Hands go up. How about nonviolent? hands go up. Then I say to them, well, you know, we're too busy in school. We've got too much to do all those things. Which would you want us to drop? Knowledgeable, responsible, nonviolent, drug-free, or caring? And of course, the parents don't like that choice. Right. But when you really push them, do you know which one they tend to pick? Which one? knowledgeable hmm. because at the end of the day if you really force parents to choose if they really had to choose not that they do but if they had to choose between a smart kid and a good kid right most parents pick a good kid yeah my mother always so, said that that manners will take you where money and knowledge won't and, well that's uh, a great saying yeah that's a great saying yeah. and and i think and, you know, I actually think that many cultures, many cultures over time have sayings like that mm -hmm. because it's just basically true. Mm -hmm. And so, so when parents come to school, now especially uh, our, our curricula are sometimes complicated. Uh, we've got certain ways of doing math and certain ways of doing other subject areas. Mm -hmm. And it's not so easy sometimes for our parents to help our kids with academics. Right. But one area where they can help and they want to help is with the, their character, yes. the kid's character. And so when we can talk to them about how their kids are developing socially and emotionally as well as academically, mm -hmm. we can turn parents into, more often than not, tremendous allies. And that's a role that I think requires some specialized attention, specialized training, and specialized skills. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you have to be available to the parents. Right. Um, it's a hard thing for a classroom teacher to do. As a teacher, you can engage in activities in the classroom that would help build your kids' social and emotional skills. That's great. But And you can notify parents about things. You could talk to them at conference time. But doing more than that, is very, very difficult for a teacher. Having an expert on staff who can help parents help their kids, well, that would be of tremendous value. All right. And so, yeah, go ahead. No, I, I, I completely agree with you, and I think we're kind of saying the same things, but I guess to help the tentacles of that person who is um, in all for all purposes, is the director of a SEED program, um, training the staff so it becomes a part of the culture of the school, the culture of the community. And if there is even that small connection um, with a student and teacher, they might notice things that they can then relay to whomever is heading this program. Um, but I... I I think this is such a, a wonderful concept and would be uh, multiplied in the magnitude of its uh, power to, to help our kids if we do involve uh, faculty and staff um, in, in the initiative. Right. Well, there's, there's no question. So, so, so today, just, uh, just this morning, um, I did an opening of school for a school district in New Jersey. The mm -hmm. entire staff was there. And uh, the superintendent invited me to talk to the staff specifically for the purpose of communicating that everyone has a responsibility for helping to develop the kids' social and emotional skills. Yes, yes. And it was really as a kickoff to what they see as a three-year effort, a three-year plan to deepen and broaden the skill building that their faculty is doing 
with mm -hmm. regard to kids' social and emotional development. Mm -hmm. So I agree 100% that uh, this is another area that's becoming more and more important. You know, um, I, I think that when we, when we look around uh, at successful organizations and we look at organizations that require people to work in teams, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of them that comes to mind is Google. Yes. Another that comes to mind is the military. Mm -hmm. And in a team, if people don't have good social and emotional skills, it is very hard for that team to be successful. Right. The team can have the best plans, they can have the best theories and whatever, but their ability to carry it out depends on social and emotional skills. Yes. And I think now that we're in a world that's more complicated and where things are so interdependent, these skills are now going to be recognized as just as basic, just as important as reading skills. Mm -hmm. And of course, once you have that attitude, then you begin to realize, yep, we've got to get everybody on board in terms of having some responsibility for building these skills. Yes. So, yep, I, I see it uh, exactly the way you do. Um, and, of course, that would make the role of the seed liaison even that much more powerful. And in talking about um, the seed liaison, the, the director of or you know whatever terminology you want to use but the person who is really heading this program um, like you mentioned in the article um, if it's going to be a school counselor or another uh, person within the school we do have to take a look at what's already on their plate and you know there would have to be some uh, redistribution some shifting um, some removal of some just to make sure that that person has um, the time and uh, can devote the energy needed to make the program successful. Right, uh, that that is that's true at, at every level. And you know, as we um, as we study different districts and schools that are effectively carrying out social and emotional interventions on a larger scale, there's almost always a team of people that turn out to have a, a leadership role. Mm -hmm. It's not even just one person. It's a team of people that work together right. to provide these kinds of things. You know, um, in New Jersey, we passed very strong anti-bullying legislation. Mm -hmm. And the role of the anti-bullying specialist in each school was given by legislation to the school counselor or the school psychologist. Mm -hmm. And, but nothing was taken off their plate. Uh. And it has been an extremely difficult situation because, because we're human beings. Right. And it's not possible to just keep adding to our plate. Absolutely. So something has to give. Mm -hmm. And so for some folks, what gave is their counseling. And for some folks, what gave is their functioning as the anti-bullying specialist. Mm -hmm. um, so absolutely, we have to be very realistic as we do this. Um, you know, in education, unfortunately, there's been a tendency to think that we can get stuff for nothing. And I don't know any place in life that's meaningful where you can actually get something for nothing. Right. And keep adding and adding and adding to people's plates and expecting everything important to happen. Mm. So that's no less true for a, a seed liaison. And there's another aspect of the seed liaison's role that's important. Now, when kids are having difficulty with their social and emotional development, sometimes they're going to need to be connected to outside resources, right. to appropriate health, mental health professionals outside of the school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I hear from so many parents, and you may have heard as well, Sometimes, parents sometimes have a very hard time finding good resources. Yes. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we have a list of names and we give them names, and, but they don't always work out. One of my uh, students did a study of um, referrals 
made from preschools when preschool kids were having some significant problems. And what they basically found was that the vast majority of referrals that were given to parents, those folks that they were referred to did not accept the referral. Oh. And parents were very reluctant to come back to the school and tell them that it didn't work out. Mm. Um, you know, we can lament that, but, but I don't think that's, it's that uncommon. Uh, and so then, then a long period of time evolves before people get help. And then when they do come back to the attention of the school, it's very often because things have gotten more severe. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, when you then go out to the community to try to find problems, to find someone to help you with a kid that's even more severe, well, you have even more difficulty finding someone. Right. So and part I of the job of the seed liaison mm -hmm. is to know the community resources right. and keep track of these referrals. And, and know how to help parents get genuine help for their kids, mm -hmm. not just a sort of a generic, why don't you try this? Right, and I'm, I'm thinking about our population and our family in general. We are military, and by the nature of the beast, we are very transient. And so our students and their families are PCSing and moving from here to there. And so oftentimes they are the new kid on the block and wouldn't know where to start. Um, and then sometimes, you know, we have behaviors or feelings that manifest because of the move. So parents haven't dealt with it before. So you are so right in that we, we need to know resources and we need to be able to provide our parents with that information. Um, Dodea does an awesome job. We have a student support team um, in our schools, um, and this is something that, whether the school liaison, uh, the seed liaison is a part of that or um, just works with the uh, student support team, um, that could be a very powerful um, team happening right there. That would be awesome. You know, when I had the privilege of presenting to the Military Child Education Conference a couple of years ago, mm. one of the things that we talked about is how sometimes inadvertently we put the greatest burdens on the people who are already feeling the most burdened. <laughs> and so when, when our new kids are, when our kids are new and coming into different schools, uh, you know, moving around as they do, it's often the case that they are expected to adjust. Well, you know, a lot of the schools into which these kids come regularly attract families uh, of uh, people in the military. Mm -hmm. So they are going to predictably be getting kids in these kinds of situations. Right. And James Comer, who is a uh, professor of child psychiatry at Yale University and a real leader of the social and emotional field for, for decades and decades and a great inspiration, what James Comer said that when you have situations like that, you should share the responsibility. And by that I mean that when you've got schools that are typically receiver schools for military families, there should be a very significant and explicit education about what does it mean for the kids coming in, where have they been, where is, where is their experience, and, and there should be a special emphasis placed on welcoming, on being inclusive. And, of course, it's not just for those kids. It's for any kids who right. are transitioning and who are new. Right. But certainly when we know that that's going to be a, a, a regular feature of our population, we have to go out of our way to make sure that we're providing that welcoming, caring environment and that people understand that with the extra support that we can give newcomers, mm -hmm. um, we, can, we can make them become a part of the school and feel more comfortable faster yes. and forestall a lot of these difficulties. You know, that, that flows from a social and emotional learning perspective that, that it, it, it really takes a village. You know, that old saying yes. is so true. Yes. 
And so let's organize the village in a predictable way as opposed to having the kids come in and then we start to worry about them when they show signs of trouble. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we can, we can avoid some of that if we're attending to their social and emotional needs, um, you know, not just individually, but as a collective community mm -hmm. and helping them feel welcomed, helping them feel like contributors, helping them to show their strengths and making, in essence, the tremendous experiences that they've had and the many cultures that they often have come in contact with and some of the incredible resilience that they've shown yes. into assets yes. and not liabilities. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, Dr. Elias, we've kind of touched on, on, on this already, but um, if you could kind of summarize what are concerns, um, or what concerns would a, a seed liaison focus on? Well, a seed liaison would, um, first of all, they would want to focus on knowing the status of kids' social and emotional development, and they would sort of be an early warning system for kids that might be having difficulty. Mm -hmm. They would be responsible for communicating, especially with teachers uh, and others in the school, about those kids and understanding the kinds of uh, circumstances that may be more difficult for those kids, certain situations that they kids may be having a harder time with. I think, as you pointed out, they would be resources mm -hmm. to the school in terms of activities and strategies for promoting social and emotional development in a wider basis. Mm -hmm. They would be thinking about the best ways to communicate to parents uh, about the kids' social and emotional development, to do that in a sensitive way, in a supportive way, uh, in a non-alarming way. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of sensitivity that goes into the communication role. And then uh, the triage piece of it is to be able to know the resources that a given child needs when a child might need help beyond what the school can reasonably provide right. and to help make sure that the parents find their way to that help mm -hmm. and keep track of what referral sources are helpful, what, what referral sources are not so helpful, and, you know, in that way improve the ability of the school to be responsive to the parents. Mm -hmm. um, those are the, the, the primary things that a seed liaison would be involved with. Okay. And um, in your article, you do, you lay those out as the four top uh, things that a liaison, a seed liaison would do, communication, accountability, early warning, and triage. Um, and I, I feel like, and we basically said it um, in this conversation, but even if, even if a person's bottom line is still you know, just academics. I don't see how someone could not see how um, taking care of the social emotional uh, needs of our students could not improve their bottom line of academics. Um, because when a child is better holistically, then everything improves, in, including the academics. Well, you know, I, I see it that way for sure. You see it that way for sure. Um, but I do know and have talked to parents who don't see it that way. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, that sometimes parents feel that it's so important for their children to get the highest grades and the mm -hmm. highest scores and all that. Mm -hmm. And I, I understand that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, from my position in the university, uh, I see that there are a lot of kids that drop out of college. Uh, Forty to fifty percent mm -hmm. of kids who enroll drop out of college, and for low-income minority kids, that number is closer to eighty to ninety percent. And what I think parents need to understand is that there's more to success than simply getting to college. It's what you do when you're there. Yeah. And what you do when you're there focuses a great deal on your social and emotional skills. Right. 
And I would say that we can look to almost any professional field and look at career advancement, and we're likely to see the same pattern. Uh, I believe that if you look even within the military and if people reflect on people they know, the, the people who advance are not the people who necessarily have the highest IQs. Right. These are people who are sensitive to their colleagues. Mm -hmm. These are people who are planners. These are people who know how to bounce back from obstacles. Mm -hmm. These are people who know how to control their strong emotions in very difficult and complex situations. These are people with empathy. These are people who notice successes and know how to build on successes. Mm -hmm. So I think that as we, we want to help parents understand that it, it's not their goals for their kids that we are wanting to change. No, we want their kids to be successful. Yes. But we need to help parents understand that what is key to success now, very clearly, is social and emotional competence alongside of academic skills. Yes. And one point that you made in there and you were saying, you know, it's more than just getting into a college or a particular college. It's about sustainability. It's about being able to stick it out and, like you said, bounce back when things don't go quite the way you thought, work with groups, work independently, figure out your next move. And the basis of that is um, being strong, you know, uh, socially and emotionally um, and having techniques in your bag that help you deal with those challenges that are just a part of living, are a part of life. Right. And, you know, think, think about, you know, in, in education and, and, again, in the military, when, and in, in most fields, when you advance, you typically have more responsibilities. Mm -hmm. You typically have a sort of a, a supervisory or a leadership role over more and more people. Mm -hmm. Those things are going to require more and more of your social and emotional skills. And so, yep, it's true in school, it's true in life, that these, these are the things that you need in order to move forward. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we're starting to recognize that. Yes. And, and that's why I don't think it's far-fetched to, to think about having a seed liaison. It's like planting the flag and saying, we think that this is important enough so that we're going to have at least one person in the school who, for whom this is their full-time job, that they've got their eye on this ball and, and they will help everybody else get involved, et cetera, et cetera. But, but we, we know we've got somebody who's going to be the leader of this particular team. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think we're going to get to that point. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you end your article with um, a subject area, is, is this feasible? And I think we both can agree, yes, it is. Um, I think we both can agree that there is some flexibility in exactly how it looks in your school, depending on, on your community and your community's needs. But it's, it's definitely something that is feasible and needed. Right. Uh, you know, and I, I think, I think the, the reality is that every, every good idea has its has people who love it, right? Right. And then you've got people who are skeptical. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to be willing to try things out on a small scale so that folks can look at the idea and come to their own conclusions about its value. Right. So, for example, it might mean that we start off by having a seed liaison for one or two grade levels in a school only. Mm -hmm. And... And at first, it could be part of the existing responsibility of somebody with some minor adjustments, and, and we come to see what difference it makes. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's unreasonable. Mm -hmm. I think the idea of a pilot, uh, you know, uh, or as we might want to think of uh, in other terms, a test flight, mm -hmm. is, uh, is, is, makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And then if there need to be some particular adjustments, we can make them before we've made a big commitment. If people have questions, they can get answered and worked out while we're still in a pilot phase. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we don't have to be in a hurry. 
We just want to make steady progress. Right. So I think that if we, um, if we're patient and persistent and are willing to start with a pilot, then this can be very feasible. I yeah. uh, just wouldn't expect uh, too many folks to jump right into it right away because it's still unfamiliar to most people. Mm -hmm. And it, it is, uh, but I know especially in our district, um, we are working hard to make it familiar, to make it a part of common conversation, a part of common knowledge. Um, and it's something that we believe strongly in and that students should feel safe and empowered um, and every child deserves a holistic education to the best of our ability. So um, this, this article was a wonderful way to, to get us thinking about the ways that we can um, either implement um, an advocate for every student in our schools or tweak or improve uh, the programs that are already existing um, in some of our schools. So um, I just want to thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us about this very timely topic um, and giving us some insight um, into things that have worked and, and ways to go about implementing such a program. Well, I am, I'm very grateful for the opportunity. I just would mention that the article came from uh, edutopia.org. Yes. And as schools are contemplating uh, being involved in social and emotional learning in any way, uh, that website has some abundant resources, videos, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that, that can help folks move forward. Indeed. <laughs> well, thank you again for your time. My pleasure.